This is the story of how one charming food influencer revealed to me my own devastating intellectual weaknesses. The story of how higher education does not provide you with a bulwark against believing whatever you want to believe, and how nobody is immune to propaganda. The year was 2017. I was in my second year of going to a fancy name brand stem cell graduate school, and the faculty there were buzzing with excitement over the microbiome. New powerful technologies and analytic methods promised to mine the untapped gold that was lying on our skin, our mucosal surfaces, and our gut. Already at that point, the microbiome had been proven to be linked to all sorts of facets of health and the development of diseases. And like many attending name brand school, I was swept away by the seemingly infinite potential of our relationship to our microbial co-residents. Outside of academia, on a little-known platform called YouTube, another meteoric rise was on the horizon. Bon Appetit's Brad Leone was just about to start his wildly popular It's Alive series, showing the world how to make fermented goods. And as luck would have it, Brad started with a project that anybody could do at home, kombucha. For those of you who don't know, kombucha is a fermented product that results from allowing a culture of yeast and bacteria called a SCOBY to break down the sugar in a tea sugar mixture. It's believed that fermented products like kombucha have a probiotic benefit, improving the health of gut flora. It was an extremely appropriate video to start It's Alive with as the starting ingredients were accessible, the setup was cost friendly, and didn't require too much space. It was perfect, and as a student of biology, I had to try it for myself. And so I did. I went out and bought some store brand kombucha, took the live culture from the bottle, and started my own kombucha journey. My final product was drinkable, although it was so acidic you could probably strip paint with it. For my first home ferment, I actually considered it a success. Brimming with excitement, I then had the idea to look up research into the actual health benefits of consuming kombucha. And what I found was… embarrassing. Up until 2019, nothing resembling a controlled trial in all of the kombucha literature existed that I could find. Sure, many articles were published on the potential of kombucha as a health tonic, highlighting the fact that many of the molecules found in kombucha have a myriad of health benefits, including antimicrobial and anti-tumor compounds. There were even studies that suggested that kombucha was able to improve the proportion of healthy gut flora in mice. But all of these studies stopped short of a controlled clinical trial in the most relevant population, humans. Why is it important that research be done in humans? What about the plethora of papers looking at individual compounds in kombucha or the studies done in non-humans? Shouldn't they be considered proof that kombucha is a healthful drink? Consider the unknowns here. Assuming that all of the research done on kombucha chemical isolates and mice are real and promising without doing these studies in humans, the following questions remain unanswered. 1. Is kombucha even safe for humans to drink on a regular basis? There are a ton of compounds that yeast and bacteria are capable of spitting out. Are we absolutely sure that all of those compounds are safe? 2. Are the so-called bioactive molecules in kombucha present in a high enough concentration in the drink to matter? 3. Are these molecules even bioavailable? Can the human gut absorb any of this good stuff? 4. Are healthy microbes in kombucha even able to colonize the human gut? Anybody claiming to be certain that kombucha has health benefits is just not being honest or has bought into this propaganda fully. Other research I found on kombucha in humans was, let's say, not compelling. There was at least one case of lead poisoning from over-fermenting kombucha in a ceramic vessel, as the high acidity of the brew leached lead into the drink. Did Brad lie to me? Did this charming goofball of a man sell me a pill of health that I was all too eager to swallow? Another charlatan in a long line of nutritional supplement grifters? I had to know. I rewatched the video in the year 2024 and discovered something even more embarrassing. Brad hadn't mentioned a single thing regarding kombucha's supposed health benefits. I had filled in the blank all on my own. Why did I get so suckered into this kombucha thing anyway? It wasn't a huge leap to make. To me, the microbiome was in fact popping off. I was constantly hearing about new insights into human health obtained through studying the microbiome. I lived in a cultural milieu of people peddling their fermented probiotic wares, from kimchi to kombucha, from yakult to yogurt, all promising benefits to my health. 
Like a magic eye puzzle, my brain filled in the gap that because kombucha was a fermented product, that it must have some kind of studied benefit for the microbiome. If I was trying to protect my belief that I am a logical but flawed person, my reflection would end there. This was surely just a failure of me to do my due diligence. But perhaps the more important reason why I fell for any of this is the whole point I am making this video. I wanted to believe in kombucha. The process to make the drink seemed fun, the end product seemed tasty, and I wanted so badly to believe that I could use my skills in the lab to create a product that would improve my health for cheap. Could you blame me? In these God-blessed United States, healthcare insurance is so abysmal that brewing your own health potions for cheap is a deeply intoxicating fantasy. And also it seemed easier than just dieting and exercising. I want to drive this point home. I don't believe I'm a stupid person, nor am I uneducated. I don't believe that falling for a grift of any kind is the result of an intellectual deficiency. But human beings are not logical operators. Humans are rational meaning they have reasons to do things. Doesn't always mean that those reasons are good or appropriate or based in any kind of logical thinking. Most of the time, the decisions we make, we make because they feel good or right. Consider yourself lucky if what you feel is right just also happens to be right. Is it too strong to say that kombucha is a grift? Yeah. The absence of evidence is, after all, not evidence of absence. Maybe kombucha's health benefits are very hard to measure. Maybe the benefits are so subtle that a study that would last long enough to capture the differences between kombucha drinkers and non-drinkers would have been prohibitively expensive. Or maybe kombucha is like a hammer without a nail. Something that vaguely promotes health, but we still haven't figured out how to measure it yet. To believe in the health benefits of consuming kombucha is not demonstrably wrong. You can expand this kind of thinking to a lot of probiotic goods in the market. At least in the US, the nutritional supplement industry doesn't have to comply with standards for evidence-based medicine. If you've looked into scholarly articles written about the demonstrable benefits of probiotic supplements, you'll find that the use cases for probiotics are, at this moment, laughably narrow. But rest assured, the kombucha faithful, I did eventually find two clinical trials on kombucha published just last year although I wouldn't exactly call them compelling. The first paper attempts to remedy irritable bowel syndrome in women. Let's take a look at the study design. The study population consists of women with IBS. They were randomly split between experimental and control groups. For four days, all of these women were put on a tightly controlled diet provided by the hospital. Then their breakfast drink was either replaced with kombucha or with water for 10 days, all while still eating their controlled diet. By the end of the study, there were statistically significant differences between the women who drank kombucha and the women who drank water. Those who drank kombucha for the 10 days with their breakfasts reported a general alleviation of their IBS symptoms, as well as had more complete bowel movements. Sounds like a win for kombucha lovers, right? Except, I neglected to mention that the drink that the experimental group got was also supplemented with inulin, a dietary fiber with proven gastrological benefits. That and uh, the control group wasn't exactly blinded. They were given water instead of some kombucha-like drink, so it's not entirely possible to rule out the placebo effect as being a factor. Because the control group did not also receive inulin as a fiber supplement, it's impossible to know whether kombucha itself had any effect on alleviating IBS symptoms. Before you go raising your pitchforks calling this study badly designed, the intent of the authors of the paper was never to study the effects of kombucha itself, but rather design a drink that people would find palatable that would also help with their IBS. Their goal was to basically sneak inulin into an appetizing drink that people could take more easily. While it certainly sounds like they were successful in their goal, it still leaves us with no idea if kombucha is actually effective in doing anything. The second clinical trial I found deals with kombucha as a potential treatment for blood sugar management. This time, the study design was a lot better with regards to investigating the actual potential of kombucha, in my opinion. This was a double-blinded, randomized, controlled, crossover trial in patients with diabetes. What this basically means is that both the researchers and the study participants were unaware of who was getting kombucha and who was getting an unfermented, sparkling drink made to taste very similarly 
to kombucha. These study participants were instructed to drink a glass of the kombucha or fake kombucha every day with dinner for four weeks. Then they were free to do whatever for eight weeks as their body reset. After this so-called washout period, if the study participant had kombucha, they were then given fake kombucha. If they were given fake kombucha, they were then given regular kombucha. This forms the crossover. The crossover study is a powerful tool that allows study participants to be their own control group. It also doubles the bang for your buck as you can do a lot more with fewer people. Throughout the study, blood sugar levels were tested to see whether or not regular consumption of kombucha helped to control blood sugar. What the researchers found was promising. While both experimental and control groups trended towards better blood sugar levels, only while drinking the real kombucha did this reach statistical significance. Surely this must be a win for kombucha. As much as I would have liked to celebrate this result, only 7 people made it through the entire study. If we look at the raw data here, we can see that there is quite a bit of variability. If we look closely, teal and light green patients start at a lower baseline blood sugar while taking the placebo, but start higher when they were drinking kombucha, potentially exaggerating this result. Ultimately, this study deserves to be filed in the PauseChamp folder as a first glimpse into the potential real effect of kombucha on health, but I wouldn't comfortably bet on it. While both of these studies are in fact clinical trials, I would still not call them compelling. Without compelling evidence at this stage, I believe that the belief in kombucha's health benefits is mostly based on faith. Faith being the belief in something in the absence of evidence. And it's okay to have faith. Sometimes you need a little faith in your life, especially when you don't have the means to confirm something yourself. And while I might be reluctant to give kombucha my stamp of approval now, it might not be that way in the future. I'll happily eat my words and wash it all down with a tall glass of kombucha in celebration if that's the case. What really mattered to me in this story is realizing that I bought into the kombucha craze without fully doing my own research. And I went to school to do research. My point here is the reasons why someone might fall for something without compelling evidence has very little to do with one's intelligence or education. We believe whatever it is we want to believe, whatever feels good and right, and it takes active work to beat those instincts down. As scientists, we learn the harsh way that it's more useful to learn how to be wrong than it is trying to always be right. I don't want to make it seem like I am anti-education. I'm a teacher. I'm very pro-education. Of course, getting a degree in something that trains you in critical thinking is going to allow you to better detect BS. But just because you have a degree doesn't make you immune to BS if you get cocky. Remain humble, be prepared to be wrong, and think critically. That's all I want for you. If you liked this video, consider checking out my live streams where I do journal clubs of accessible biology, like this video on the effects of vaping in mice. I not only want to spread the joy of biology, but also want to help the general public develop scientific literacy skills. And also, it's just a lot more fun to do science when you're not doing it alone. Thanks for watching.